My name is Josh Casper, and I'm the founder of Art Basel and Beyond. In fact, I'm both an art fanatic and an amateur collector. I had the privilege of touring Carol Furman's Brooklyn studio a few weeks back. We saw how she made her iconic swimmer sculptures, how they were painted. We then went upstairs to the offices and got an entire tour of the full operation. Carol and I also sat down and had a coffee table conversation where we discussed her life and some of the hardships she's had to overcome on her way to success. If you don't know who Carol Furman is, she is one of the founding members of the hyper-realism movement. This is definitely not a video you want to miss as her sculptures are extremely lifelike. So be sure to like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos just like this one. Hi, Connor. Good to meet you. Thank you, I'm Carol. I'm Josh Gasper. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me in your studio okay, today. Let me show you the main part. Perfect. Sounds fantastic. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Carol is one of my most favorite artists, one of the founders of the hyper-realism movement. And when I first saw her sculptures, I was a little bit scared because they looked so lifelike. <laughs> I almost ran away, but they're amazing and we're gonna see some of them in just a second. So this is where I have all my prints. And uh, I have what's known as like little boutique. Okay. And, uh, I sell, uh, shirts, bags, and all different things related to my art, and uh, raises money for my art foundation. Oh so, yes, the Carol A. Furman Art Foundation. Yeah. This is one of five studios. Okay. And I have a little studio here. Hi. Hello. So is she working on one of your uh, iconic swimmers? Yeah, it looks like. a bronze. Bronze. So that's actually bronze below This is that. Madeline. She's doing, it's called chasing. She's chasing one. This is Brian. Hello. Hello. Nice pencil. Thank you. It's a good place to keep it. It is a great place to keep Brian builds grace and he packs and every single sculpture has its own crate. As you can see, here are two sculptures that were made. Fantastic. Corny, you're gonna be on. So take, take a look at how realistic these sculptures look. When I first saw it, like I said, it almost scared me because it looks so lifelike. So you say the underpinnings of this is actually bronze. Yeah, well not all. This one is resin. And okay. If you take a close up of what Michael is doing, he's repairing a sculpture that somebody bought years ago. And it was a Malcolm, Malcolm Forbes sculpture. Oh, wow. And Courtney is working on uh, Mini Serena, which is my most famous sculpture. I did it all different sizes. And Courtney also worked on this sculpture in the back, which is bronze. And it's going to get painted hyper real, and you'll never know, ever, that it's bronze unless you click it. <laughs> now, that sculpture over there, the lady on the tube, is that what was Catalina? Is that yeah. the first? No, no. That's and I have an okay. old essay I wrote. I just submitted it to an essay contest oh, wow. on Inner Tube, which became Inner Tube Variant 2, okay. which became uh, Serena and its survival of Serena. So how did you come up with this idea to have someone coming out of the pool? Did, did you see it and say, I have to duplicate it? What, what kind of was the impetus for that? Well, I've always been fascinated with swimmers, and uh, ever since I went to the beach to escape my life, my difficult life, and I saw this woman coming out of the water, and the water was streaming down her face like a little drop, and her hair was wet, and I thought, wow, I, to me, I was very young, so I thought she was an older woman, maybe she was 25, but okay. I was really young, and uh, I identified with her, and she was like, like so... Exhilarated and proud, you know how water refreshes you. Yeah. Absolutely. And I said, "Wow, that's me." And I identified with her, and I did my first one wow. based on my memory of her. It wasn't her. It right, was just right. the swimmer I named is Catalina. We have it upstairs. We'll definitely have to take a look at that. And I also I saw something so cool on YouTube. You were doing like a is it called a life cast? Yes. 
So do you, you do a, see the one of Richie? Do you <laughs> do you do a, a lot of the life cast, or are most of these just kind of like generic people that you come up with? Or I are, used to. You used to. Okay. Yeah, and I sometimes cast the hands and feet. My techniques okay. have changed through the years as uh, modern technology advanced. Of course, I can imagine. This is Heath, and he does the eyelashes, eyebrows, sculpting, painting. He can do just about everything, but he does very detailed work. So a lot of these this, this, are pretty long. Yeah, well this may be This is a hyper real piece. And if you look inside, which nobody ever has the privilege of doing, you can see the inside and you can see the epoxy and, uh, and how it's made. So when you turn it right side up, it looks super real. That is amazing. And is it just regular oil paints that you're using? No, on, no. On I'd like to bring Rob into the picture. Rob is a painter. Oh, okay. He paints. I did immediately. Second time today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about the painting process? The process starts with uh, an automotive primer. Okay. Um, ultimately, everything is painted in a, uh, a urethane. And a urethane automotive. Okay. Got it. Um, it gives us a beautiful finish. It allows us to put pieces outdoors. Okay. Um, oil paints. Yeah. Which are great because oil paints you can endlessly blend and smooth and highlight. Um, but they don't last. You know, because we're the only ones that make sculptures hyper real for outdoors. Not only. And we only. learned how to do it through childhood. So the automotive paint kind of gives you some weatherproofing as well. Absolutely. Because it's used to being on someone's car. Correct. So then you take it, you pop it on a sculpture, and now you've got a swimmer forever. <laughs> a very long process. Um, not only are we the best in what we do, we're the only ones. The only ones that, that do it. So um, if you want to just come over here, I'm yeah, just yeah. give you a, this is a, this is a big piece. This piece will go in a water park, a sculpture park. That's amazing. Now, my background was one of um, an automotive custom car. Okay. I'm a car guy, so as soon as you said automotive paint, I knew. So what are we working with here? <laughs> so this is, these are all urethane. Okay. And uh, I've been doing, uh, prior to my, I mean, Carol and I have been together, we're working on our second decade together. Oh wow, congratulations. We, we go a long way back. Um, but my uh, background was one of uh, doing custom paints on hot rods and okay. uh, you know, flame jobs and murals and bands back in the 70s. And, uh, surfboards and guitars and anything that anybody needed painting. I can totally see how that would directly translate onto this, especially just looking at her painting suit. There's so much work that must go into that. Something that's interesting about Carol's sculptures is that she doesn't put the clothing on the sculpture. It's actually sculpted into it. So a lot of other artists, they use different pieces to kind of add to them. Carol, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is all sculpted into correct. it. It is part of it. And that's a unique thing that makes her sculptures more special. And in my personal opinion, a lot prettier than the people that are trying to copy it. Take a look at the various stages of paint. So, let me just show you this. Uh, this is the tabletop. Yep. Uh, I mean, it's all of 18 inches high. But if you look, at the mesh, you can here. see the perforation. Yeah. Right, so that is painted on. That's, that's trying to it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. So, how long would you say it took you to perfect this? Is this like a career's long journey to perfect to have it took, this? Look? It took me. It took <laughs> forty years to become an overnight success. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah that, is <laughs> that is. I mean, that is. So amazing. we go from from this scale with things that are as miniaturized. As miniaturized as the mesh, you can see her, where her belly button would be. Yeah, absolutely. To painting a monumental piece, which is not, uh, this also goes uh, outside the sculpture park. Yeah, and you can see right in the water. That goes right I in the water. I have to get closer to that, that's okay. I won't. Sure. So this is, so they're bonded resin. Someone runs, someone runs. This is a But let me just show you, since you're a, you love the car thing. Uh, 
this is one component of the paint. So this is, you know, we use a uh, metallic. Very metallic. Yeah. Beautiful, right? And then with a little bit of pearl. Yeah, oh, we love pearl. <laughs> we love pearl, yeah. We love pearl. That's actually the color of my car. There you go. <laughs> so. So that's the kind of quality that our client expects, right. and we have to deliver, otherwise there's... So is this resin? This is yeah. the epoxy, okay. this is a little paint on it, and eventually this gets put on the body. Wow. Oh, I see. So they're not one continuous piece. No, no. no. Oh. Here, here, she's missing her arms, and her arms are... Oh, I'm going to take this one. Wow. So this is the kitchen, it doubles as where I photograph things, and it's also my conference room. And this is my painting room. Oh wow. And I do details in here. And my awards room. <laughs> so cute. We have an <laughs> elevator. So we have uh, four different offices. I share the office with. David Brown, manages the business. Oh, yeah. So on your full-size sculptures, we'll call them your life-size sculptures, how many crystals would you say could be in the cap on a life-size sculpture? Oh, <laughs> and I know they're all placed by hand because I've watched so many videos. So today, Art Basel and Beyond came to Carol Foreman's studio in Brooklyn, New York. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh Casper. I work full-time in finance, but I love art and launched Art Basel and Beyond during COVID to provide viewers just like yourselves with the front row seat and insight into artists' lives, what made them become artists, and some of the inspiration behind their work. Today, we are so fortunate to sit down with Carol Furman, who is one of the founders of the hyper-realism movement. Carol, thank you so much for having us in your studio today. You're, you're welcome, it's my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Now, I know you, of course, your career started out as an artist, but one of the things that we had talked about a little bit earlier is that you're actually an author, too. Can you tell us a little bit about your autobiography? And by the way, congratulations again on the reprinting as well. I made five dollars today from <laughs> So that makes me a professional author. Exactly. So I wrote my autobiography because you can see there's four ta t coffee table books about my life, one is missing. And in all these books, famous people, historians and curators interview me and they want to know questions about my career. And that's the, they never, ever want to know about me and my life, which led to why I make these sculptures and some of the questions you, you know, you told me you were going to ask me. They want to know, they don't want to know that. They just want to know, they put me in a historical context with my work. So I think that um, I wrote the book for a couple of reasons. One, because I really wanted to talk about um, my life and... Mm -hmm why I did what I did and what led me to making swimmers and it's all in my autobiography and I also um, want to be a role model for other artists and other people who want to accomplish something with their life because um, I never gave up. I always wanted to be an artist. My parents disowned me. My oh no. first husband <laughs> divorced me because nobody really knew what it means to be a professional artist and none of them wanted wanted me to be that. So I, I still continue to do my art. Um, at that time, when I was doing my art, the art world was uh, mostly a good old boys club. Mm -hmm. And it was really yeah. hard as a woman to even make it in the art world, but um, nothing stopped me. So I wanted to tell my story. Absolutely. Well, thank you for taking the time to walk us through your story. And I'm, I'm so curious because one of the things that, that you have accomplished throughout the, your career was the creation, and I'll, I'll go back to some of the questions on this in just a sec, but of your sculpture foundation as well. 
what what was that like? And are you one of the first females to have that your own sculpture foundation with so much success being a founder of an entire artistic movement? <laughs> I don't know if I'm the first. The foundation is more common than okay. uh, you know than than making it as a female sculptor who makes one of a kind, you know, sculptures that have never been done before. But just for a second, to going back to my autobiography, this was the first autobiography, and then um, I I updated it because okay. our minds don't let us think about the bad times. Mm. You know, we can think about it when we're writing, but if we had something really bad or some bad experience, like one after another, you, your mind tends to forget them and you don't write them down. So after I wrote my whole autobiography. Two years later, which it is now, um, I realized so much has happened in the last two years, number one. And number two, I remembered all these things. Like the middle of the night, I'll remember something. And uh, I felt that I had, to, I had to do a second edition. So what changed going from the first edition over to the second edition? Is it a different part of your life that you, you wrote about? Yeah, I mean, I wrote... I started the second edition in the now, and I started with I, I'm in Venice and I'm having this show, which was three weeks ago. People are waiting online to see my show, and my next show uh, is in Saint Tropez, which is in this June. And then I said, so how did that happen? Then that's the prefix, and then I go to chapter one. Chapter one is where the first book started. This book starts with now, and then it goes back to the beginning. So that's got it. Absolutely. So what? What initially got you? It's also after the pandemic. Oh the my gosh, that's is a great the point. Pandemic. Wow, I feel like so much writing came out of this so pandemic because things just changed. But so much art also came out of the pandemic art, too. Yeah. So that was one of the the beautiful things that that came out of it. What um? What was it initially that got you into art? And sculpture in particular, because <laughs> you're you're such a known sculptor. People, of course, don't know you as necessarily someone that's painting a canvas. It's a different type of canvas, nonetheless. Funny. But what brought you in that direction? You know, um, I was painting on the floor of my home okay. when I was three or four years old. And my parents uh, left me with a babysitter. And they also left me with uh, my mother's oil painting gift that she never opened that I was dying to look inside. So I mm. took my fingers and painting with colors all over the floor was very rewarding. <laughs> and then I was, th and I don't even know where the babysitter was, but then I was thinking, oh my God, what if they come home? So I took um, a dish towel and I tried to wipe it off and it was just getting worse and worse. I was spreading it and then uh, I figured, Maybe they're not gonna like this, so I hid in the basement. So that's my earliest. I love that. <laughs> my earliest recollections of being an artist, and uh, then I remember when I was about in fifth grade, I perfected the technique of drawing with a pen, and I did a one line, and like like Alex Katz actually. Okay. But I did one line, and I could draw the, a figure, and I never picked up my pen, and I was drawing all these figures with one line and I was drawing a female body. So I thought this was pretty cool, and, and I was sitting in the back of the room one day in fifth grade, and I showed the boy sitting next to me, look, this is how you draw a body, I bet I could teach you how. And all of a sudden I hear the teacher screaming, come to the front of the room. And she says, what, have you, what, have you, what do you have? And I showed her the picture innocently of a stick figure of a girl, and she said, ah, a female nude. <laughs> I didn't even think about it. And she sent me to the principal. No way. Yeah. Wow. And the principal, <laughs> he thought it was pretty cool, actually. It, the, the punishment wasn't that bad. He said, you know, I'm going to have to punish you, so I'm going to make you teach the class how to do that with one line, <laughs> but no figures. Can you think of like an animal? OK. So, so I taught the class how to draw a tiger. So I was giving art lessons in the fifth grade. Wow. So successful in it that um, each class of, in the fifth grade was rotating in every week and I was teaching art. Wow, that is that is amazing. I don't think now you would get in trouble for drawing a nude. I think times have changed. 
but it is a, a very interesting punishment that could have been the start of everything that we're looking at looking at today. So I guess for all the teachers and principals out there, you never know never. where the student is, is going to end up. Um, but it also shows you, and I look back on my life, and it shows you that if you really have a passion for something, nothing can stop you. It's it's such a it's such Nothing a true point. Nothing should stop you. Nothing should. It, it, I I like that exactly. And you know, in in the Art Basel and Beyond community, we have so many artists that are engaged with the account. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, what was your big break into the art world? You know, it takes a long time to become an overnight success, and I'm not saying that from experience. I don't know personally. Um, Carol definitely does, but what? What what was kind of your big break where your art really started to sell and you were like, all right, like now things are moving? Well, I don't know if it's so much that my art is selling that makes you have the break because I always look at it like, um, well, I don't see my own thing, but then people tell me I'm super famous or they wait online for my autograph, but mostly in Europe. So <laughs> I, and you know, so I know I'm famous, but what? happened to me was pretty much it was difficult, difficult, difficult. My first show closed and I couldn't get a gallery and on and on. But then um, I had another show and Malcolm Forbes bought my whole show. At that time he was like such a big deal because he had Forbes magazine and, yeah. and he was constantly in the news. I don't know if you're too young to remember but he went out with Elizabeth Taylor. Okay. And, um, he was a big deal, and he bought like everything in my show. Just when this, the last day when nobody bought anything, and then um, after that, that, and that was in '84, and then Parks and Recreation after that showed my work in Central Park and in Soho, and in 1997 I was invited to the White House, and I met Hillary Clinton, wow. who uh, wound up with a sculpture for a private collection, and President Clinton wound up former President Clinton. And then um, another big break was in 1999 when I did my first coffee table book, and it's this brown book under here. Let's definitely then, make sure. You know, we I'm a book person, so to have a coffee table book means you're going to leave, leave a legacy. So I realized at that point that it's not so much being famous because when you're dead on your epitaph, it doesn't say she was a famous artist. Yeah. But you know, if you leave something behind, like the story of your life, or or these books in libraries and in, uh, and in bookstores and in museums, then you do inspire other people. So that was a, a big turning point. Um, another very important turning point was when John T. Spike. Um, curator invited me to show in the Venice Biennale at the gates okay. of the Biennale and he said that pieces have to be huge, monumental, and I never you did. You do a lot of huge pieces now. <laughs> that was the beginning. Uh, and I did uh, Catalina, my, my first swimmer, and I did uh, the Serena one, monumental, and they became the mascot of the Biennale. Uh, half a million people saw them, people waited online. There's wow. one a shot of a woman kissing kissing the sculpture, which they used on the catalog, so that was important. And, uh, you know, when I look at my life, there are a lot of different positive turning points, and sometimes they happen just when everything isn't going right. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Can you talk to us about the hyper-realism movement? Because if I'm understanding it correctly, you're one of just three founders, and it didn't exist before you came along. So if you can just speak a little bit to, to the movement, I think that would be great education for the viewers as well. Well, you know, we talked briefly about the fact that I was a painter yeah. and uh, with my fingers on the floor, and um, I never thought of myself as a sculptor. And as a matter of fact, I didn't even like sculpture, and I never studied sculpture. Ah, oh, okay. So in um, college, I was studying illustration. And I needed to do illustration because I had to pay my way through college, and I did illustrations okay. for Time Warner, and they paid me. They paid my tuition. They, was, they didn't pay me. So um, I I was doing these illustrations, but I really wanted to be um, I really wanted to be a fine artist, and I didn't. Okay. I like realism. I was doing very realistic things. So my illustrations started to become 
three-dimensional, and I did a sculpture called Nose to the Rhinestone. Um, I was hired by um, by a magazine, I'm trying to remember which one, it's an important magazine to do the cover. Um, and I did a, a wax figure of a man, and his nose was ground off, and there's a Rhinestone, it was pretty gross. <laughs> it became, it went viral. Oh my gosh. And, uh, that was my first three, you know, hyperreal sculpture. And then I did another one and another one, and I was doing them as illustrations. Got it. No sculpture classes. No. So this is sort of like... I almost yeah. killed somebody the first time I, I oh, really? cast his face because I wanted this job so badly to do the cover of... It was National Lampoon okay. that um, I said I knew how to do it. Oh, no. And the person who posted me had to be in pain. So if you go like this in terrible pain, can you imagine holding that for a half hour? Oh, my God. So he was holding it, and I, I didn't know how to do it. I put plaster on his face, <laughs> and I couldn't get the plaster off, and he was in pain. Oh, my gosh. But it all came out. <laughs> so that's kind of like the irony here, right? Carol has never taken a sculpture class, but yet here she is, this super successful um, sculptor uh, with all these so lifelike um, types of, if you said it's resin, and if it's not resin, it's bronze, right? It could be bronze, it's res epoxy resin or bronze. I, I mean, I've done every I've done everything. I did wax and it melted off the wall in a museum, so I stopped doing the wax. Uh -huh. And it was all born out of illustration. It came exactly. from illustration. So I know earlier on we hit briefly on the Carol A. Furman Sculpture Foundation. Is there anything that you'd like to share with us about that before we talk about Catalina? Well, just that um, the original idea for the foundation came to me because I was so discouraged and like I said, I had to pay for my own education. and I had art teachers tell me I'd never make it. And I was thinking, oh, no. all it, I mean, I had a few tell me I would, so all it takes is somebody you respect telling you you're good and you'd make it. So I thought, I could do that for deserving artists. I could help them. I'm going to start a foundation. And to raise money for the foundation, I, the books. Anybody who buys a book through my foundation, I'll sign it. And, and I put the money to help deserving artists, unrecognized artists. So that's how. That's we'll definitely be getting a coffee table book, and I feel like Carol has more to come on that front. I know we talked about Catalina downstairs, so I think we'll, we'll skip her for now. Can we talk a little bit about your signature water droplets? <laughs> How did that I come to I told the magazine, and I'll tell you, I'm not giving tricks. How did it come to me? You want to know that? I'll tell you. Fair enough. So I was sitting on the beach, and I saw the woman, a woman coming out of the water, and there were water drops on her face, and it was streaming. Her hair was wet, and she was walking like this. And I said, "Oh my God, I'm going to make a sculpture with water drops." But um, I didn't even know how to do water drops. Okay. And in those days, you couldn't, you know, you, you could. I tried nail polish. I tried lacquer, just like other people would try to copy me. And uh, they were not making any resins that we knew the positive. So if okay. it went in the sun or any water got on them after you did it, it turned awesome. yellow. So, I mean, I have a sculpture, the original sculpture that I made in this room with this yellow water drop. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody noticed. They loved it. So I know one of the other things that you're known for are the life casts that, that you've done. But these, these concepts, so then I come up with uh, the golden mean or something, the perfect balance between you know right and left. So I get the concept, I get the model, I pose the model, and then I have to make a sculpture of the model. And mo you know, so I will cast them, or I, I try to cast them. Okay. And nobody can hold the pose, most of the <laughs> poses. So I, I cast them with a, a silicone. Okay and I do them in sections, and then I assemble, I make a, a 
positive in plaster. I assemble it. Okay. And then I have to cut it apart and change the angle. And basically, that's one technique. And through the years, like now with 3D scanning, I can, I still cast, but maybe just the hands and face. Okay. And feet, and I'll scan the body. And on, a, on my computer, I can bend the body more and do different things. So, I it must have been interesting for you over the course of your career to see how technology plays a part. I mean, did you ever think when you were first doing this that you'd be able to play around with it on a computer screen? Let me tell you, I didn't even know what a computer was. <laughs> you know, in my day, we didn't even have cell phones. Yeah, that's, we didn't even that's have, true. <laughs> we didn't even have pampers. <laughs> um, how many people would you say you've life cast over, over, over the years? Do you think, is it in the hundreds? Is it in the tens? What, what do you think? I don't know. You know, I work with the concept. I work with a sculpture like Serena since 1981, and I'm still doing it. So it's not so much casting a hundred or two hundred people. It's more like creating something that I am proud of that will withstand the test of time. Absolutely. Last question we've got here is, what's next for Carol? <laughs> Oh boy. Aside from the next coffee table book. Yeah. Which we know is coming. Yeah, there is <laughs> there there are two possibilities with the next coffee table book and uh, very exciting ones. Uh, Sw Swimmers two or a Rizzoli book, I'm not sure. So that's in discussion. Um, I have a the Medici Museum show in Ohio this summer and they're they're gonna buy a sculpture. That's exciting. I will have a show at the Pyramid Sculpture Park in this country. And um, another exciting thing is I want to be in the, these Venice Biennales again. Yeah. So I want to have my own pavilion. And with that, that would be amazing. Right? <laughs> with that, I want my own studio in Venice, Italy. So those are some of the things to look forward to. I'm going to your solo show in September. It's still running in September. I will be in Venice. Really? And that is it on be, it, that is on my list. Be. So there's going to be a part two. And to this. San Tropez. Oh, and San Tropez. Yeah, okay. the 25th. I'm going to San Tropez. I have pieces all over the city and in Venice. And in September, I have a mini museum show in Paris in a very big museum. Well, I guess I missed you because I just got back from Paris. <laughs> I'm not there yet, though. Not there yet. Well, Carol, thank you so much for your time and all the insights and sharing your life story with us. Um, for those of you that want to learn more, you've got the autobiography the as new option one. number one, yeah. and then you've got the new one as option number two. So with that, Carol, thank you so much. You're it was welcome. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.